And so I want to talk now about the strategy of preeminence, which is a, a philosophical strategy that I believe once you learn it, you will use to replace everything else you have adhered to as far as the driving strategic force behind everything you do, everything your team does, every relationship you have, and the way you relate to everybody in your business and in your life. I'm going to do it two ways. The first is to give you the big overview, global 30 or 50,000 foot overview. And then I'm going to tell you the basis of it, and then I'm going to give you a lot of detail. And the detail is going to require me to refer continuously to notes that I took uh, a long time ago, and it's going to be a little bit more extemporaneous than even this. So first of all, the strategy of preeminence starts out by asking you to suspend from today forward the way you have operated your business, the way you have looked at your relationship with your clients, the way you have looked at your goal and purpose. It suggests and, and demands, actually, that from this moment forward, you see yourself in the relationship you have with your clients as their most trusted advisor, counsel, confidant in the field of endeavor, in the area of expertise, and in the outcome area that your product or service at work in their life or in their business produces. Is that too complicated? Let me try to state it differently. You want to be seen from now on by everyone you deal with as the definitive expert source and the most trusted advisor and as a fiduciary, as somebody who has taken on the responsibility of their, of their governance, of their decisions, of the best interest as their most trusted counsel, not as a purveyor of a commodity, not as a generic seller of services or products. In order for you to successfully adopt and embrace the strategy of preeminence, philosophical strategy in your organization, you have to start a bunch of different shifts in the way you refer to everything you deal with. The first thing you've got to shift in is this attitude of who you are selling to. We are in a world, a competitive world, where there are two, count them, two separate forces trying to turn every one of us into commodities. The first is our competition, who wants to marginalize our advantage, who wants to marginalize our, um, our distinction, our differentiation, uh, any preemption we've got. The second is the consumer who wants the same thing. They're pushing forces like mad on us if we succumb, if we embrace it, if we accept it, then we basically wave the white flag of surrender. The way that you change it is to start mentally by seeing yourself as the trusted advisor. And as such, you will never, ever, ever, three evers, again, allow one of your clients to ever purchase less than they should, in less quantity or combination than they should, in less quality than they should, less frequently than they should, because to allow them to do that is to breach your fiduciary responsibility as their trusted advisor. If you know with certainty that doing something one way and in one combination at one level is going to produce four or five or ten times the result for them, that doing it a lesser way or not doing it will occur. And you are, in fact, wearing the hat as their trusted, permanent, definitive advisor as their ultimate counsel, as their fiduciary, you can't let them do it. You wouldn't want your attorney to say, well, do this, even though you're going to be exposed to all kinds of litigation and, 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 um, and danger, would you? You'd want him or her to basically grab you philosophically by the lapel, shake you a little bit and say, look, you could do that, but it's going to be not the best outcome. It's going to be not in your best interest, and it's going to have a terrible result. Here's what you got to do, and here's why, wouldn't you? So that's the attitude you got to get. Now, you got to start by realizing that you, um, okay, you got to start by changing the focus of what you do and who you do it for. Most people I have met in business when I first meet them have fallen in love with the wrong thing. 
they got the hottest, coolest product or service or company in the market or in the world, and they are so enraptured with it. Everyone's rallying around the company, and they want to be the fastest growing or the biggest, the most successful dominant force in the market, and all their team members are rallying behind it. And that's admirable, but wrong. You should not fall in love with your company or your product or your service. You should fall in love instead with your client. Because if you fall in love with your client and everything you do, every recommendation you make, every communication you utter or expend, everything about your being and existence is designed to see their life better off, their life more enhanced, their life more enriched, their life more protected, their lives more benefited, depending, of course, upon the, 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 the result of the product or service that you render being, being act, act, actioned and implemented in their lives, then you're going to have an incredible advantage over everybody else because you are living for their betterment. You are you are existing to see their life massively improved, expanded, protected. In order to do that, you've got to see your relationship with that buying force or with the people who you, you serve as one of an advisor, an expert, an authority, a counselor, a fiduciary. They are your clients. You'll notice I try frequently and very rarely will refer to anybody who buys anything from me or from any of our clients as customers. I try to refer to them totally and always, pardon me, as clients. Why? Because it connotes a much higher level of relationship, a much, much greater sense of intimacy, bonding, trust, respect, authoritative respect. Most people don't have authoritative respect in the selling environment. You do when you practice and live the strategy of preeminence. The strategy of preeminence requires you to think of people as clients because of two reasons. Number one, as a fiduciary, that's what they are. Number two, look up in Webster's two words, customer, client. I'll save you the trouble. Customer, according to Webster's, is someone who purchases a a um, commodity or a service by referring to the people you sell to as a customer <clears throat> verbally or even in your mind you're waving the white flag you're saying hey I'm nothing more than a commodity you can buy me you can buy him you can buy anything else look up client yeah. Webster's Dictionary defines client as someone who's under the care the protection the betterment the well-being of another which one makes better sense to you Okay, so you gotta basically see them as a client. Then you gotta realize you have three sets of clients in your, under your service, only one of which pay you, you pay the other two. The first one is your team members and staff. If you don't fall in love with them, if you don't want for them the greatest outcome, the greatest growth, the greatest, the greatest achievement, the greatest satisfaction, the greatest happiness, the greatest purposeful, the greatest, happiest families, their families to be the richest they can be, both in monetary terms and in, in emotional and psychic terms, then guess what? Then the chain of, of congruency is broken. They can't basically be a lever or an extension of your big vision, can they? Think about it. Same thing with your vendors. Trying to hammer them down, trying to basically get the, you want them to be successful. You don't want them to get more on you than they should, but you want them to see you as their greatest advocate, their greatest admirer. You want, you, you want them to think of you first, to constantly be coming up with solutions, improvements, innovations, breakthroughs for you. The strategy of preeminence presumes and expects you will absolutely commit yourself, your company, your entire team of clients to constant array of breakthroughs in the areas of marketing, strategy, management, innovation. Management, I'm not gonna talk a lot about because it's not my skill set. Marketing, strategy, and innovation, non-technical are. Change your marketing, you change your results big way, big time. Increases of 
Hundreds of percent or thousands of percent yield are absolutely possible, as I'll demonstrate to you uh, tomorrow when I get into, into uh, my power parthenon and geometric growth and, and the three-way to grow a business model. Number two, uh, change your strategy, change your total result, change your time, change your impact. Fastest, easiest, most certain way to lever up a business almost overnight, change the strategy, change your business model. Absolutely. And tomorrow I'll go through the nine drivers of upside leverage and geometric business growth, and one of them is strategy. Innovation is a misnomer to a lot of people. People go, oh gosh, it's high tech. Can be, but it's not necessarily. All it means to me is, is orchestrating greater beneficial enhancement or improvement to your client's life or situation that they appreciate and value. It doesn't much matter if you've got the ability to make a product 10 times uh, better if the client doesn't appreciate it. It doesn't ma much matter if you've got the ability to, to produce it at one-tenth the cost of your competitor if you don't bring a cost savings to the client or use the difference to add to the, to, to the package so they get a better outcome. You've got to understand, if you study the greatest companies today and the greatest companies throughout really uh, the last 50 years, they are historically the companies who engineered the maximum quantity of quality and consistent, meaning continuous qualitative breakthroughs in those four areas. Marketing, strategy, innovation, management, okay? The, the, um, the strategy of preeminence requires some other things that you do. The first is you can never, as I said, allow someone to do whatever it is they want. You got a moral obligation not to allow them, and a good point. Um, I need a half filled glass of water. Will somebody who's got a half filled glass of water bring it up to me? Those of you who've ever heard this before, as redundant as it is, you can't hear this enough times, and having it made prisoner on video so you can demonstrate it to your clients in terms of your, your team members or your vendors and suppliers is great. Presume I own J. Abraham's bottled water shop and, and, uh, and pure water bar. And Stan comes in parched and throws $2 on, on the counter and says, I want a half a glass of water. If I take Stan's money and gleefully and jubilantly say, OK, thanks, sir, and I go to the tab and go, shh, and hand it to him, knowing as I do, because I am an expert on water and its impact and implications to the body and the mind, the spirit and soul, that if all he drinks is a half a glass today, while he may temporarily satisfy his parched taste, his, his molecular, cellular um, um, chemistry will be compromised, his brain chemistry won't function, his organs won't, 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 won't work, his elimination won't eliminate, he's going to be more stressed, he's not going to operate at peak mental acuity, he's going to be probably grumpy, irritable, less than perfect, he's going to be a wretch at home, he's going to be a wretch at the office, he's going to be less effective in sales presentations and motivating people and negotiating with his vendors, he's going to compromise longevity, he's going to suscept himself to more, more, um, more health problems, but if I just take his money knowing that and don't first go out of my way to authoritatively educate him, to make certain he recognizes the implications and my recommendation that he get himself seven and a half more of those either here or somewhere and that he doesn't consciously, that I don't make sure he's consciously aware of the implication and the, and the need and my passionate belief that he should be getting seven and a half more even if he can't take them all here and drink some later today or that he, if he doesn't like me, he gets them somewhere else. If I take his money and allow him just to take that without extending my fiduciary responsibility, then I've breached my moral obligation. Does that make sense? Concurrently, if he comes and buys eight glasses every other day, but he should be getting eight every day, and I don't do the same thing, don't make darn certain he knows that it's much better to get eight a day or every other day than, than a half, but you're compromising. Man, you're gonna not perform well. You're gonna be, you're gonna live less. Your body's gonna be breaking down. You're gonna be a lousy leader, manager, husband, father, lover, uh, friend, thinker. I am doing him a gross and a grievous and a moral disservice. Does that make sense? That should be the methodology. That should be the basis. That should be the, the reason why neither you nor anyone in your employ should ever again allow anyone to consciously buy less than they should, in less combination than they should, in less qualitative levels than they should, 
less often than they should because you are deserving them. Does that make sense? Now, I want you to think for a minute. Think about your life. Think about the transactions you have in your business as a, um, as a, uh, as the executive buyer for all kinds of products and services for your business and in your personal life as a consumer for necessities around the home, for products or services that uh, you use for indulgences. Think about the people you deal with and think about the people in your life that you respect the most because they are not passive, they are not equivocating, they are not um, uh, willing to solicitously and panderously let you buy anything you want. They take a stand. They assert themselves. They authoritatively say, stand. Can't do that. I can't sell it to you. It's not going to serve you well. It's not going to serve you well. It's not right for you. And, it, and, and, and the example goes two ways. In the book that we did for the consumer market, we told the story of the bicycle store that counseled the father who was buying his son the first bike that he shouldn't buy the $400 one because first time he's going to fall. He's going to beat the you-know-what out of it. It's going to be harder. It's a, it's a wonderful bike, but it's much harder to ride. The $125 one is a much better starter bike. It's going to serve him well. It's durable. It can be banged up. It can be ridden half, uh, half as, I mean, twice as fast and get balanced, take training wheels off. It was pr purposely designed for this purpose. As soon as you're done with it and he's gotten all the, the, the trials and tribulations, then you can upgrade him. You've got a responsibility to guide them to the right decision, and you've got to see your relationship as a permanent one, not as a... Um, a um, static one. You've got to see that you're having a relationship with that person forever, and even if you have currently nothing else to sell, that person is important to you. He or she is, become, is becoming a valued client and a dear and valued friend. And as such, you've got an obligation, responsibility to counsel, guide, and concern yourself with their well-being for the rest of their life. And that means connecting with them because they're a rich source of expanded business, of referrals, but that shouldn't be the reason. The reason should be that you shouldn't be in business unless you care about their outcome. And you should be able to visualize, in Stan's case, I'm picking on him, you should sleep like a log every night because, as you know, there are 878 families and 425 enterprises in uh, Salt Lake City right now who have got a 90% you know, certainty that if anyone breaks in, they're not going to get wiped out, they're not going to get rave mugged, pillaged, they're not going to lose everything because within you know, within uh, 25 minutes, the police will get there. And when people see that they've got protected by that, they're not even going to come in. And you should know. That should make you understand. Those people have got a higher probability. If you looked at it, research why 10 times the probability of living, 10 times longer of, of having less trauma in their life, of having happiness. And when they come back from a, from a long business trip or a vacation, not having a shock or not getting called in the middle of the night. And that's got to be so comforting to you. And that's what you live for in the analogies. Does that make sense? The strategy of preeminence presumes another attitude, that you look at everybody out there that you want to do business with and that you make it a point of deciding that you're not going to wait for money to change hands before you start contributing, guiding, counseling, advising, consulting, protecting them. And it will blow their minds because it will de definitively and differentiatingly It'll set you so apart from everyone else you deal with by the way you, you do it. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I decide that I want a relationship with Stan or, or Paul or Michael, and Michael doesn't see it yet, it's incumbent on me to protect him now because I'm only going to enrich him, protect him, get him better, better um, molded for when we start doing business. And... I'm going to constantly deal with him as if he were already my client. It's a very powerful distinction. The strategy of preeminence also asks and expects you to do something else. It says that you start, you, you dispel forever the question that most people struggle with non-verbally all their life in business. The question that most people struggle with is, am I worthy of the goal I've set. Can I really build my business to $5 million? Can I really make $850,000 a year? Can I really attract you know, 2,500 clients a year? Can I really keep them all satisfied? Can I really 
uh, stay on top of all the knowledge and all the changes? Can I really compete with the bigger, larger, more aggressive, better capitalized firms? That's not the question, as you'll see tomorrow when I give you all the secrets to geometric business growth. The right question to ask yourself from now on is this. Is the goal worthy of me? Because you'll learn very quickly. There's so much more, higher and better achievements, connection, contribution, impact, education, protection, enhancement, enrichment, entertainment, if that's what you serve, that you can render. And you should live for making people's lives better because you are in it. Uh, I interviewed a good friend of mine, Fran Tarkenton, a couple of years ago on, his, on the meaning of business life, according to him. And he said that his belief is very simple. Anytime he ever impacts anybody or comes together on the phone, in person, he wants to have, he, when he's done, he wants to leave them better off than they were because he was in their life for that period of time. And that may be that he entertains them. That may be that he educates them. That may mean that he acknowledges them. Part of the strategy of preeminence means you learn to listen. You learn to hear what people are saying. You slow down enough to make their point more important to you than your point. And you acknowledge them. And you are genuinely interested in what they are doing. I've told this story many times, but I'll tell it one more time because it's profoundly appropriate here. Many years ago, probably 10, I was in Australia flying in to do a seminar. Good seminar. Big one, actually. About, about 400 people paid $5,000. It was a really good one. I'd flown for 17 or 18 hours. I had my family with us. We landed Sydney. We were tired but very juxtapositioned. We, um, they went to bed. I couldn't. We were in, I think, back then, the Sydney Hilton or Sheraton. Nice hotel, commanding view in the, in the upper uh, tower of the whole uh, Sydney Harbor. You obviously know where I'm talking about. Um, I couldn't sleep, so I went to the concierge suite, which is a big room with a bar and other things for the top couple floors. There was one other gentleman in the corner about where uh, Michael is in the back. That's the only person there. I, of course, love people. I love people naturally. I walked over and started engaging the person. I told the person two things about myself. My name's Abraham, and that I was here from the United States on business. That was it. The rest of the 90 minutes conversation that entailed were me curiously and, and genuinely um, fascinatedly, if that word exists, asking a barrage of provocative questions that just, just stimulated me a lot. For example, I asked him, first of all, his name, where he was from, what he did, why he was here. I found out he was from, us, uh, from Germany. He worked for Shearing uh, Corporation. He traveled the world calling on world health officers and ministers in, in third world countries, marketing Shearing's population control programs. That got me pretty fascinated. I said, well, what is a population control program? I learned a whole scope of what they were. I asked, how in the world do you make a cold call on a third world health minister? Does he just call up cold? Do you get a referral? What do you do? He gave me the whole explanation. I asked him a myriad of questions. I then asked him what it was like selling it, how many calls it took, what the, the ideology was necessary, when a third world country would embrace population control, what the populace thought about it, when you sold it, what, how many different forms did it take, what did it cost? How did it get paid for? Once they bought into it, how did it get disseminated? You know, and applied and administered? Um, what happened if there was a change of the regime? How much of the money that they paid you went to your company? How many went back to them in some covert manner? Um, I asked him what he was gonna do when he grew up because I figured he must have an incredible Rolodex. There was a big, big, turned out, uh, very high level, high security, um, third world health minister um, um, a symposium going on in that hotel, which was really fascinating to me. Um, I then switched and said, I want to know more about life in Germany. I asked him what it was like, family, the climate, the, the, the economic climate, the political climate, the lifestyle, the values, the more, the religion, what his kids were like, what the schools were like, what opportunities there were, what education there was. I asked him a bundle of other questions about all kinds of things that were both commercial, fraternal, um, um, just lifestyle. And I'm drinking cognacs all the time. I was drinking cognacs back then, and they were good. And after about 90 minutes of me asking him this barrage of questions, I uh, got tired. 
And so I terminated the conversation, told him that I had uh, enjoyed it, and uh, excused myself and started walking from about where Michael is to the doorway that was here. And about at, what is your, your, your name, gentleman in the blue? The Only Al. Al, where Al is, the, the man said, wait, I got to tell you this. And he spoke very fluent English, but with a German uh, accent, which I can't synthesize here. He said, you are absolutely the most interesting man I have met in the last five years. And I was, I was inebriated to a high degree by that time, but I was lucid enough to stumble my way to the elevator, lean on the, uh, on the side, not so that I wouldn't fall in when the door opened, and reflect for about five minutes in fascination at a phenomenon and a, and, a, and, a, and a principle that I'd never thought about. It was so simple and yet so evasive and elusive to most people. If you want to be the most interesting person in the world, all you have to do is be the most interested. If you want to be the most respected, all you have to do is respect. If you want to be the most, um, the most um, passionate, have passion for others. And it's like a mirror image. So that's part of the strategy of preeminence. The next part about it is that you've got to realize that it's not about what you say and do, although I really respect the things that Chet will teach you and has taught you, and I'll spin him. It's about how much more value you can give to your prospective client that they appreciate and desire. It's not about what I said before, having a unique selling proposition. It's about establishing yourself from the very beginning as the only viable solution to a problem, a challenge, an issue, or an opportunity in their life that you alone give clear and absolutely dimensional and tangible um, um, animation or, or shape to by crystal clear explaining it and titling it, something that no one has ever connected the dots for them for before. It's about never, ever, ever again allowing anyone in your employ to not share your vision and recognizing that they can't share your vision if you don't share it with them, not just in an, in, most people uh, make the terrible mistake of going right for the bottom line. We're all about making the customer or the client the most, the most valuable person to us and we're passionate about them. Well, you've got to get people through the process sequentially, bring them along, particularly your team clients and your vendors. They've got to be able to see life the way you see life. And that re requires you to first see life the way they see life. And the only way you'll do that if you practice the strategy of preeminence is literally to do the following thing. Decide this moment that from now on, you will commit to try and always examine, understand, empathize, respect, appreciate, and, and carefully evaluate how everybody else you interact with sees life. You don't have to necessarily agree with them, but unless you appreciate it, unless you respect it, unless you understand it, unless you empathize with it, you can't really serve them, you can't fall in love with it. Now, I'll give me a little example. We used to do seminars. Anybody who came to Old Mastermind and some of the X Factors, we would take one evening and I'd, give, I'd bring 400 books or magazines. Anyone ever hear when I used to do that? And I would give them out. I'd say, okay, and I have magazines that were on all topics and books. I'd say, okay, what's, what's, your, what's your hobby or your biggest interest? Like, Stan, what, would you, what, 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 what are you the most interested in? Flying. What? Flying, I like flying. Okay, so if he likes flying, I would give him a book on pottery. Uh, somebody who liked pottery, I'd give them a book on flying. Somebody who liked um, um, intellectual things, I'd give them a book on bodybuilding or a magazine. I'd make them go home or go to the room that night and read at least two articles or two chapters and come and find something fascinating and tremendously interesting to them that they could report on and find really uh, meaning and intrigue for for themselves and report with passion, and it would always happen. And the point I'm making is, 
You're selling to people who aren't always like you. You're, you're trying to lead and inspire people who aren't necessarily like you. Not only like you in interest, like modalities. Some people are, are visual. Some people are kinesthetic. Some people are auditory. You'll see them express themselves in different ways. They'll say, look at this, or listen to this, or see this, or watch this, or, or read my lips. And that's showing you how different their mind processes. I really impact most powerfully people who are very, very uh, auditory and very visual and graphic. Some people who are real linear have trouble calibrating for me. I got to work harder to try to appreciate how you see life or you see life, but unless I appreciate it, unless I understand it, unless I empathize with it, I can't basically ratchet up or down to enough lowest common denominator to build a bridge of trust where I can counsel you. And I can't do that if I'm not interested enough to extend myself.